here, so there you have it. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm deeply honored by this invitation. And this is my first visit to Korea, and uh, I enjoyed every moment of it. I thank the organizers for the superb job. On the other hand, uh, I am uh, I have been always a great admirer of uh, Fyodor's mathematics. And uh, in the last five years, when I started my collaboration with Francesco Russo, this is my co-author, the influence of uh, his work was uh, very important in our research. Therefore, I'm once again very happy to be here and to wish him all the best. OK. Now, The title is uh, hopefully self-explanatory, so uh, this is joint work with my friend Francesco Russo from the University of Catania. This is uh, how I plan to do things. The subject combines many things. First of all, what is called the classical or Italian projective geometry and uh, the work of Severi, Terracini, Scort, Safano, and others, I have tried to write the most important names. So I apologize for those who will be omitted. Secondly, there is much work centering uh, around the Hartung conjecture by Barth and Van de Ven, Fulton Hansen, Theodor, Fartings, Netzvetaev, Bertram and Lazarsman, Landsberg, and many others. I will also refer to work on dual defect at 24 by mainly by Ein and Bertram et Tiffany And there is also part of Morris theory that is important and its applications to Fano manifolds, and particularly work by Mori, Mukai, Juan. Monk, Vishniewski, and many others. Now, the part of Morris theory I'm referring to is the bi-regular part of Morris theory. So, the technically most difficult part involving singularities and flips is not to be used. So, my apologies to Miles. Now, the context is hopefully already familiar, and I'm pleased that the notation is. Uh, very much the same as that of some previous speakers. So uh, we work over the complex field, and uh, X will always denote an embedded smooth, uh, irreducible, and non degenerate manifold whose dimension is small n and co dimension small c. Now, here is the first definition, which is of course, familiar to everybody. So X, such an embedded X, is a prime final manifold of index I if its Picard group is cyclic generated by the hyperplane section. And of course, the index is a multiple giving the anti-canonical. Now, examples show that these objects have some very interesting and special properties if, on one hand, they are of high index, and on the other, they are not complete intersection, which are considered to be the standard examples. And these are, first of all, this is an experimental fact, not a theorem yet. So they tend to be quadratic, that is to say, skin theoretically intersection of products, and on the other hand, they have small co-dimension. That's what experience shows. Now, I'd like to make precise the statement high index. And uh, this would be exactly given by that inequality, namely, if the index is at least dimension plus half dimension plus 3. As we shall see later on, dual defective and some special second defective manifolds provide interesting such examples. Now, an easy definition, I 
say that X is covered by lines if there is a line containing X and passing through the point of X. There is nothing complicated here. Here is a first interesting fact proved by Mori, namely that when X is a prime final manifold whose index is at least half dimension plus two, this is one less than the bound I introduced previously, then X is covered by lines. And I don't know if this is a classical fact, but there is certainly a classical example, which is... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please. Can you see what is it? Prime phenomenon. Yes, it's uh, uh, the, of the first species, right. the classical term terminology, main, uh, namely embedded okay. with simply Picard. And the classical example is undoubtedly the one of final complete intersections whose index is at least to the fourth of the cubic strip. Okay. Now, some familiar notation. If I fix a general point, I denote by L sub index X a variety of lines contained in X and passing through X. It can be naturally seen as a sub scheme of the projective space of tangent directions at the point, which is Pn minus 1. But just think of it as a space of tangent directions at the general point x. Now, probably this is the most important phrase of uh, what I'm going to show, namely that there is a strong interaction between the geometry of the given embedding of X in P capital N and the geometry of the much smaller objects, namely the variety of lines passing through the general point X inside the space of tangent directions. But this is the, the moral of this talk, if you want. It will be illustrated by several phenomena. Maybe it is a place to point out that this is a classical aspect of a nowadays famous uh, contemporary theory due to Huang and Mock, namely the variety of minimal rational tangents, of which this is the classical aspect, because here the curves are light, so their tangents are themselves right. The obvious thing. Moreover, the higher the dimension of the variety of lines, the stronger the interaction is. Moreover, in the special case of prime finals, simply by a junction formula, the dimension of the variety of lines is just the index minus 2. So speaking about the index or about the dimension of this variety, this session is the same thing. So the previous inequality translates to saying that the dimension of the family of lines through x is at least half n minus 1. Now, please remember, I don't know, there is a, ah, yes. Please remember this inequality, because this is kind of magic number. And we shall see that whenever the dimension of the variety of lines is at least this, some very good behavior happens. Uh, we shall have the opportunity to illustrate this by a number of theorems. Okay? Questions? Okay. Now let's pass to the manifolds covered by lines. And so let us fix such a manifold. Now I won't refer to all lines on X. Instead I I'll be choosing some irreducible component of the Hilbert scheme of lines such that they cover X. Okay? And I will be consistent with the notation, namely F sub X will denote the variety of lines from this irreducible component passing through the general. This is just to state some results in the good uh, degree of generality. Now, please allow me some more notation. A will denote the degree of the normal bundle of a, a line from my family. And then standard deformation theory shows that 
On one hand, A is non-negative. This is essentially equivalent to saying that the family is covering. That's nothing. And moreover, that this number is precisely the dimension of the family of uh, lines passing through a general point. Just think that because of generality, the splitting time of the normal bundle, the corresponding splitting time of the normal bundle of the line is made only by zeros and ones, right? And so if uh, you want to fix a point, then you subtract one, right? So what remains is the number of ones and that's the degree, and that's the dimension. Everything is non obstructive blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, that's the first theorem Maybe I, I'll put everything. A first theorem that I call. So it is a first instance when we see that this uh, magic number has very good consequences. The first result is that, so assume the variety of lines passing through the general point is of at least of that dimension. Then the first theorem that's due to Beltrametis or Mezivishnevsky in the 90s, is that you can contract them. So there is a Mori contraction of these lines. Well, this means that this is a morphism uh, with connected fibers that is a normal variety, and the curve is contracted exactly when it is numerically equivalent to uh, proportional to uh, uh, one of the lines from, from my family. So the second theorem is that if you take the general fiber of the contraction, which is a Farman manifold, then, as remarked by Vishnevsky, this is a prime Farman manifold. Moreover, meaning that its Picard group is cyclic. Moreover, it is still covered by and its index is given by this. Now, maybe I should point out that here we are talking about the same lines. And let me explain this. So here you have your x, and you have the general point, right? And here I consider the fiber through this point, right? Now, the lines are contracted. So each line through x actually stays in the fiber, right? So the lines I'm referring to do not change if I pass from x to the fiber f, right? So this theorem is essentially a reduction to the case when the Picard group is cyclic, simply by considering instead of our given x, the general fiber of the modified ratio. The third fact will be crucial for our talk. It is due to Huang and tells us the following. Now, please notice that here, this is a priori lying in Pn minus 1, right? That was the space of tangent directions to x. But due to this stupid remark, it actually lies in the space of tangent directions to the general fiber. OK. But now the general fiber has cyclic Picard group, as observed previously. And Pang's theorem tells us that this variety now is smoothly reducing and non degenerate Let me emphasize that the fact that it is smooth is standard. The fact that it is irreducible is a trivial consequence of smoothness because due to this inequality, and of course n is bigger equal than f, the dimension of the general fiber, so you have that a is at least half the dimension of this guy, right? So where it be two components, they should meet. And this would yield singularities. So this, if you want, this is a standard part. The highly non-trivial part is the fact that this is now non-degenerate. In projective geometry, non de being non-degenerate is gratis because in principle, if it is degenerate, you just take a smaller projective space. But you cannot do this here because you are in a fixed space. 
the space of directions, right? And this is a, a very useful result. The proof uses, on one hand, ideas from differential geometry, namely foliations, and also uh, Fyodor's normality theory. I'm pleased to hold this. Okay. Now, let us recall the answer conjecture. Well, I break it the HC. So, whenever the dimension is at least two times co dimension plus one, then X should be a complete intersection. Let me also remind you that when uh, Hudson formulated this conjecture some 35 years ago, well, he was basing himself on some examples. In the meantime, some evidence came mainly through Theodore's normality theorem. But let me also point out that <coughs> this inequality was not shown by some theoretical arguments. It came uh, due to, uh, how to say, because examples on the border show that you, that's the best you can hope. But to the best of my knowledge, no one made some theoretical argument giving this bound as natural. So hopefully we shall see such arguments in the special case of final manifolds. Okay. Now an innocuous uh, definition. Uh, it's an ad hoc definition. If you don't agree with the definition, well, uh, I mean with the name. The definition is okay. So I will call a line a contact line if there is a hyperplane in the ambient projective space containing the projective tangent spaces to x at all points on it. Now, this is a rather trivial remark, but it has some meaning in the context, namely that a completing the section never contains such contact. The reason is that the normal bundle twisted by minus one of a complete intersection is ample. So its restriction to the line should also be ample. On the other hand, being contact means that there is a section in the dual. So over a curve, an, an ample vector bundle has no sections in its dual, right? So that's that's uh, a proof of this uh, remark. And now, this is our first result. So assume, you see, assume that the dimension is at most double of the co-dimension. Well, if you believe the Hartshorn conjecture, you can say, well, otherwise, x is a complete intersection. So we know everything. The first point is another evidence that this uh, uh, miraculous number it has uh, some good implications. So whenever the dimension is big enough in descent, all lines in F are contact lines. So in particular, X cannot be a complete intersection. But this is more because, uh, well, if there exists one contact line, then X is not a complete here. All contact lines, all lines have, have to be contact lines. So this somehow explains give some geometric condition explaining why x cannot be a complete intersection. Sorry. Secondly, when the picard group is cyclic, we get an upper bound for this dimension. Again, under this condition. And if you believe the truth of the Hudson conjecture, then you get a more serious bound, which is, you see, two-thirds of n minus one. And this is uh, kind of non-trivial to prove. OK. Now, so far we have been talking about the significance of the dimension of the, the number A, the dimension of the variety of lines. Now I will say something about degrees of equations defining the variety and how they reflect in the geometry of the variety of lines. And the main result will come by combining the two kinds of information. One, 
on the dimension and the other on the degrees. So apparently, well, here I assume nothing. I just make some notation. So ooh. So assume that X is skin theoretical intersection of M hypersurfaces, just all the decreasingly the degrees. Assume that M is minimal, of course, there are no redundancies. And then introduce some strange number. The first one uh, we have already seen. And this number D is just the sum, but not of all the degrees, only the first C ones. C is a co-dimension. And then you uh, subtract C and make this one. So at first sight, this number has no intrinsic meaning. So it, it, it may seem curious, uh, strange. But uh, I hope to convince you that uh, a very good number. So the next results will relate, as I told you, the equations of the given embedding to those in of the variety of lines in PM minus one. Just a small definition I will call X conic connected if through two general points there is a conic joining them and containing X. That's not so important. So here is the first result, the second result, sorry, whose first point tells us the following. So if the variety of lines is not empty, it is set theoretically defined by at most D equation. D was that strange number I introduced before. In particular, the dimension of the variety of lines is at most n minus 1 minus D. Trivial. Next. Conversely. If that number is at most n minus 1, then by the fundamental existence theorem of projective geometry, the variety of lines is not empty, so x is covered by lines. So this gives you a numerical criterion to verify that uh, x is covered by lines. Assume, moreover, that n is at least c plus 2 if x is quadratic. This is a technical condition to ensure that you are in the range of the bar class theorem to deduce that the Picard group is simply, nothing more. Then, first, x is a prime final manifold of index a plus 2. This is bar plus x, nothing more. Now, it will be more interesting. The following conditions are equivalent. So, first, if x is a complete intersection, then the variety of lines is a complete intersection of co-dimension d. This is classic and well known. This, of course, implies that the dimension of the variety of lines is n minus 1 minus d. This is a triviality. The non-trivial implication is 3 implies 1, which is essentially due to Bertram Pein Lazarsfeld in the early 90s. And they were basing on a classical assertion of Severis. Actually, the result was proved by the very four surfaces, and then you can generalize it. The point here is that you can characterize complete intersections by asking that the canonical be a multiple of the hyperplane section, which is anyway a necessary condition, and that the multiple be exact. This is so this explains. Okay. So, as you see, the property we are interested in, namely to decide if X is a complete intersection, for instance, in relation to the Hartzell conjecture, or for our own pleasure, is certainly related to the fact that the same property holds for the variety of lights. And moreover, if you can compute exactly the dimension of the variety of lines, then you know precisely if x is or not complete intersection. Right? 
here is the next, our next theorem. So again, assume that we are in the wonderful range, and assume that the variety of lines is a non degenerate completing dissection. Then we are tempted to say that x should be a completing dissection, right? Be careful in the previous theorem, in order to say then x is a complete intersection, you should know that the dimension of this variety, which is a complete intersection, is the right one. This hypothesis is not present here. But however, we can prove that then x is conic connected. We have this bound, upper bound for the dimension of the variety of lines, and especially we have that n is at least 2c plus 1. So you see the magic number from the Hartson inequality appearing here through a, let's say, general reason. So there is something about this bound, even if the Hartson projector is formed. So, uh, okay. Well, there are not many people believing the truth of the Hartson conjecture, uh, as we have just seen. But maybe the following weaker form has more chances to survive. And this is what I call the actual conjecture for funds. The statement is the same. But I moreover assume that x is fun. Now one good news, this is a theorem in codimension 2. And this is due to it was proved the, at the beginning of the 80s by Balico and Kanti. So at least in God dimension 2, it holds. Moreover, if this restricted form of the function conjecture would hold, then the following two facts would be true, and uh, hopefully this would be nice. So first of all, if the dimension is at least the degree plus 1, then x should be a complete intersection unless projective equivalent to the Grassmannian of lines Blucher embedded to p9. This follows from some analysis I made in this paper. But the important thing is that this bound is optimal because the degree of the Sega embedding is n. And of course, for n at least, three, this is never a complete intersection. So this would yield a really optimal and nice bound. Moreover, this shows the Grassmannian, and uh, we shall have several occasions to see this wonderful Grassmannian of lines in before in the near future. Okay, uh, let me also tell you that, to remind you maybe, that 35 years ago, independently Hartshorn and Barton van der Veen showed that if n is at most it, it, it's bigger or equal than a quadratic bound in the degree, then x is a complete intersection. And this was a started, the starting point of the Babylonian type, uh, Babylonian tower type theorems and blah, 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 blah. So that's uh, a long story. But this would, it, that, that bound is, if I remember well, half degree times degree minus five. So it has no geometrical meaning and it is ugly. So this would be the best bound. And it would follow from this restricted Hartshorn conjecture. The second consequence would be the one I already referred to in the previous theorem. So if x is covered by lines and the dimension is big enough and the variety of lines is a not a generic complete intersection here, then x is a complete intersection. Of course, because the previous theorem showed you that in this case you can deduce that n is at least two times for dimension plus one. On the other hand, uh, due to what I explained previously, being non-degenerate implies that the Picard group of x is z. So you are exactly in the uh, range of the atom projectable forms. Okay, now the the good news and uh, probably the main result of the talk <laughs> is the fact that all expectations are fulfilled in the quadratic case. So when the variety is an intersection of quadrics, all that we have dreamed of happens. 
first. So assume from now on that x is quadratic. Now first, you see, if n is at this co-dimension plus 1, then x is covered by lines. So we can use them. Moreover, this, the variety of lines, is scheme-theoretically defined by c or dimension independent quadratic equations. This is the first point. Second, let us, you see, I'm going upstairs, so I put uh, stronger and stronger conditions. So assume we go one step further, then x is a prime final manifold. And moreover, the following conditions are equivalent. So x is a complete intersection, the variety of lines is a complete intersection, the dimension is a good one. Please note that here it is a co-dimension, not the D that was uh, hard to compute, right? You don't, you have no information. This is a, just a codec. And also a well-known necessary condition for being a complete intersection. I have already mentioned it. That's a normal bundle twisted by minus one is n. So all these are equivalent in this case. Okay. Here, of course, we are saying that the Hudson conjecture is true. Finally, we have a bound that is related to the first theorem and which explains, at least in this particular case of quadratic manifolds, why it is difficult to find uh, funnels of high index other than complete intersections. Simply because when the index is higher than this bound, then x is necessary. Okay. Now, please allow me to explain roughly the proof. Now, the proof comes from the general observations we have made already, and some miracles, some numerical miracles happening exactly in the quadratic case. So, please, I hope you, you can see what I wrote here. So, assuming x is quadratic and impose the Hartson inequality. I want to prove that x is a complete intersection. The first remark, stupid remark, is that for quadratic manifolds, the mysterious number d is just a co-dimension. Remember that it was the sum of the first c degrees of equations defining x minus 1. So when it is quadratic, these numbers are 1. And you sum from 1 to c. So this is c. What do you say? Well, so in this case, this, say, uncontrollable number is just a dimension. Well, that's good news. Then, this condition is stronger than this one. So now, if you remember that c is d, theorem 2 tells you that the variety is covered by lines. So we have lines, let's play with them. Moreover, the same theorem tells you that the dimension of the variety of lines, the number a, is at least n minus 1 minus c. It was n minus 1 minus d, but d is c. OK. The second point is kind of more subtle. And I need to recall very briefly a classical instrument in projective differential geometry. This is a second, the projective second fundamental form. I won't give the def formal definition, but this is a linear system of quadrics, denoted like this, on the space of tangent directions at the general point. They are essentially describing the tangent cone at the fixed point of the singular section hyperplane sections. So general hyperplane section uh, will be, uh, you will have a quadratic singularity, right? So you have a quadric there, which gives you the, the, the tangent cone, right? And the set of all these quadrics is a linear system, which is called the projective second phenomenon. I can give a more formal definition, but now the, the crucial fact is that the variety of line in the quadratic case is just the base locus 
of the second fundamental form. The base locus is made of asymptotic directions, meaning lines, tangent lines, having higher contact than the minimal one with x. Right? So in particular, lines contained in x are part of the, this inclusion holds for any manifold. In the quadratic case, this is an equality in the scheme theoretical sense, and this is crucial. Now, the third step is that if you assume this inequality, we have much more. Then the dimension of this linear system attains its maximum possible value, which is co-dimension minus one. This is due essentially to Terracini and then put in more than form by Griffiths Harris in the famous papers, paper in, uh, on uh, local differential geometry. And uh, uh, it follows from the Fulton Hansen connectivity theorem. So here, again, we have some, some miracle. So in particular, our helix is now scheme theoretically because that's the definition of the base locus defined by exactly C, that's a linear system, that's a vector space, independent quadratic equations. Okay. Now we have to do something very intelligent and crucial. Namely, we have this inequality, right? Let's write it this way. Let's just be, right? You see? Once you've done that, you can say that your LX inside Pn minus 1 is scheme theoretically defined by a number of equations which is smaller or equal than half the dimension of the ambient space. And now we are really happy because there is a deep result by Faltix proved at the beginning of the 80s asserted that under these conditions, Alex is a complete intersection. Let me kindly point out that in order to apply Faulting theorem, you have to know that your variety is smooth, irreducible, non-degenerate. But this follows from Planck theorem, because due to this inequality, you also know that A is at least n minus 1 to 2. Good. So this is a complete intersection. But it is a complete intersection of quadrics. And their, their number, they are independent, they are C independent quadrics, right? Exactly C. So what's the dimension? If they are independent, it's, it's a complete intersection. Then the dimension is n minus 1 minus c. So the first, the second theorem applies, and x is a complete intersection. So you see, really the quadratic case is made of a bunch of miracles which uh, allow us to conclude. But there is some more surprise, namely the following result. our assumption that x is quadratic. So let us look at the border case. So assume that the dimension is just the double of the co-dimension. And let us assume that x is not a complete intersection. Well, if it is not a complete intersection, then it is projectively equivalent to one of these guys. And uh, <laughs> the news <laughs> is that these are exactly the two examples Harrison was basing his conjecture on, right? So some of you may consider these results as support for the actual conjecture. Others, well justified as well, may say that this, this is evidence for the contrary, because they may say that the examples Hartshaw was based on were very, very special. In fact, <laughs> these are the only ones, right? Hopefully, I hope you understand what I want to say, right? Good. Now, I still have uh, maybe.
Mr. President. Uh, <laughs> 10 minutes, thank you. So my choice is, uh, I'll be quick because time is running, but I would like to show you how we were pushed to discover this result. Because we never thought about proving or disproving the Hartson conjecture. This is a difficult problem. I don't want to lose time, right? Instead, we were studying some special objects, the so-called defective manifolds. There are two types of them. The second defective ones and the dual defective ones. So in the last five years, together with Francesco, we studied these objects. And then, essentially, we realized that for the variety of lines of these two types, interesting types, I should say, of embedded manifolds, namely some special second defective ones and dual defective ones, the Hartson conjecture holds for the variety of lines. And this suggested to us that it should be a deep relation between the two. Right? And that's how we arrived at that point. So that's the story. There is also the last new result I'd like to present. But the most important part is that we, we came to, we came by to the, this particular form of the Hartman conjecture just by studying some, something different. OK, so I'll be quick because the definitions have been already uh, done by some of uh, the speakers. So the second variety is, of course, the closure of the locus of seconds. And uh, the expected dimension is uh, this one. And the difference is a defect. And its second defective one is positive. There are two cases. Either the second variety does not fill the whole PN. So this is saying that x admits a non-trivial isomorphic projection. One striking fact is that no examples of defect greater than 8 are known. This is uh, one of the mysteries of the universe. The other case is that when the second variety fills up Pn, then if you translate that delta is positive, this is equivalent to saying that the dimension is at least a codimension. So this is saying that variety, such varieties are of small codimension. And then, of course, there are all the topological abstractions, uh, a la Bart, and so on and so forth. Now, there are many classification results in, given by classical authors when n is small. But in general, understanding such defective manifolds is difficult. So we shall study a special case where some tools could be. So this also has been recalled. So you consider the second code. And its trace on x is the entry logs. Yeah. And all we know is that, in general, is that this is of pure dimension delta and connects to general points. But otherwise, there are few theorems. I, I think uh, Ziv and Lopez have such one of these. So we may consider the case when the, cone, the second cone is linear as being the simplest. And the simplest cone is the linear space. In this case, the anti-locus is a quadric. Of course, assuming that x is not a hypersurface, which is a trivial. So this finally leads us to this definition. I say that x is a local quadratic anti locus variety abbreviated like this if two general points may be connected by a quadric of dimension delta. The remark is that delta is a maximum possible value. So the next theorem. Well, that's not so interesting. It may be found in these papers. So these manifolds have rather striking properties. For instance, they are funnel and rational, and the rank of the Picard group is at most 2. The case when it is 2 is completely described. There are only 3. Then the difficult case, as usual, when the Picard group is cyclic, when Either you have the Veronese, second Veronese, or uh, the index is given. It's a funnel with, whose index is given by this. This also should remind you some interesting things for the experts, because this tells that n and delta have the same parity. 
And now this is very, very useful. When delta is at least 3, the property of ring L well transfers from x to the variety of lines. And this allows us immediately to make an induction and to classify them in this range. And this implies and reproves the famous Zach theorem uh, in a very easy way. Now, the most important things for us now are x is a complete intersection if and only if x is a point. And in this case, the, dimension, the defect is the maximum possible. Moreover, if x is not a quadric, then there is this natural bound. You'll see why I said natural. And equality cases can be classified. OK. Now, this is a conjecture which, if true, should, uh, uh, well, uh, close the subject. So we hope that the remaining case is given by, well, by can all examples can be got by starting from rational homogeneous manifolds and then performing linear sections or and isomorphic projections. So these are completely classified and if this may be both conjecture holds, then you'll get as a consequence a complete classification of the defective of these LQLs. And moreover, at least in this particular case, we shall see that unless x is a quadric, delta is at most 8, which probably well, will explain something. Now, apparently, we shall talk about a completely different subject. Relax, this is not the case. The dual variety is, of course, the set of tangent hyperplanes. And here again, you expect the dual to be a hypersurface. And the when it is not, the missing uh, number is the dual defect. A classical fact tells us that when a variety is dual defect, it, it is covered by linear PKs. In particular, it is covered by lines. Uh -huh. Now, a scroll is what everybody knows, and X if x is a scroll such that the dimension of the fiber is strictly bigger than the dimension of the base, then x is dual defective, and the defect is a difference. Now, the study of dual defective manifolds was begun by Ma 1478. And maybe for young people, I should say that they should refer to a wonderful book, which is uh, Ramanuja Memorial and to the contribution by Manford to the subject. It is in this paper that Manford shows that the Grassmannian of lines in a projective space of uh, even dimension is defective, of defect two. And there is a nice story. Hopefully, Miles will play out. Uh, <laughs> namely, that he Manford says, I'm sure there are very few of such. And then there is a footnote, reading. Uh, Miles really informs me that scrolls, well, whose, uh, with this property, are also examples. So to be read, defective manifolds other than scrolls are very few. Good. Then, uh, later on, uh, Landman and Jack proved that uh, this uh, parity result, remember the previous observation, maybe, with a dual defect instead. So, uh, Fyodor's theorem of tangents yields an upper bound for the defect, which is co-dimension minus one. And then in two famous papers in 85, 86, one in Invention and the other in Duke, Lawrence Hein proved the following two things. So he computes the dimension of the variety of lines of the general point in the, net, uh, in the special, in, the for, in terms of the defect. So you see, here we, we are in the magic number uh, range, because k is at least 1. So a is at least n minus k. Okay. Uh, that's good news, right? The second is that when x is not a scroll, then there is an upper bound for the defect. 
And moreover, in quality holds exactly for the self dual manifold, namely again the Grassmannian and the, the Spinorian SDM. Now we are able to improve it. So here yeah, you may compare the bounds. And moreover, equality holds exactly for this. Sorry, I have to. Okay. This result is optimal because it comes from a characterization of scrolls among all dual defective manifolds. So this is best possible. And the proof, of course, is completely different and lies on the geometry of elix. Actually, I was working with a normal bundle and he was using the Bernison spectral sequence which I don't think is exactly a good tool for uh, projective geometry. I have full respect, but, uh, you know. So uh, here, well, uh, we are also using this. The, the model is that we are reduced to understanding dual defective manifolds when the big group is seen. And here comes a conjecture. The conjecture is that such a dual defective manifold with cyclic Picard group has to be an L coil. And this, uh, if X is both dual defect and an L coil, the defects are related by this formula. And uh, if the conjecture would be true, then we would have a complete classification of dual defective manifolds, and we also prove Manford's uh, impression, namely that. There are very few, and the defect should be bounded by four, unless it is a scroll. Mm -hmm. Now, the last thing is this, just to reassure everybody, including the, the president, our president. So the bounds, the two bounds, coincide when built up. If you put, so I gave two bounds, two upper bounds, for the dual defect K and for the second defect delta of LQLs. But they coincide if delta is k plus 2. Where does this come from? Well, if you if make explicit computations, those bounds express exactly the Hudson conjecture, namely that the dimension is at most two times the dimension. But this is fully compatible with the fact that, as I showed you, an LQL may be a complete intersection only if it is a quadric. While a dual defective manifold can be a complete intersection only if it is a linear space, and this leads to scrolls. So this is uh, essentially this is Hartshorn conjecture in disguise, and we first proved that, and then so we realized that uh, it should be something true about that bound given by Hartshorn. Thank you very much.